This week on Talking Pictures with Neil Rosen, we'll look at the new dark comedy Saul Firm featuring Barry Keoghan, the satirical comedy American Fiction featuring Jeffrey Wright, Wonka, the origin story of the beloved fictional character Willy Wonka starring Timothy Chalamet, the courtroom drama or anatomy of a fall, plus our picks for the best movies of the year. We've got all that and many more movie picks coming up. I'm Neil Rose and welcome to Talking Pictures. It's our monthly Critic Roundtable show where we debate what's worth watching and what's not when it comes to new releases, hidden gems, and Hollywood classics. Joining me are Bill McCuddy from the popular podcast Sitting Around Talking Movies, Lisa Rossman from The Ruby Report, and Wilson Morales from BlackFilmAndTV.com. Now let's start out with a look at several new films and limited series in theaters and or streaming, beginning with Saltburn. Let's take a look at a clip. Oliver, I was going to say we should do something fun for your birthday. A proper party. No Henry's, something actually fun. What do you think, darling? If Oliver would like it, I think it's a splendid idea. I think Oliver looks like he'd rather throw himself out of a window. What kind of party? I don't know, whatever you want. What do you think? About a hundred people? A hundred? Or two. It invariably ends up being two, doesn't it, with this sort of thing. Invite whoever you want. All your friends. What friends? Lisa, tell us about Saltburn. Well, Neil, <laughs> this is the sophomore effort from director Emerald Farrell, who gave us the revenge thriller A Promising Young Woman, A Woman. She also co-starred in Barbie, by the way, as Madge. Uh, this movie is part talented Mr. Ripley, part Brideshead Revisited, as in, imagine if Baz Luhrmann directed a murder mystery in which the denizens of an uber posh British estate hosted a young Tom Ripley as a boarding school student with feelings for their prodigal son. The cast is insane, Rosamund Pike, Richard E. Grant, Jacob Elordi, Carrie Mulligan, and it offers these dizzying montages of gorgeous clothes, humans, decor. But, and there's a big but, in my opinion, <laughs> yeah, the empty, yeah, the empty entitlement of its characters, in my opinion, extends to the film itself, which is less clever than it fancies itself, with a super dumbbell third act. I would say, think of Saltburn as a very rich meal that leaves you queasy rather than sated. Boy, every movie you mentioned, I like so much right? better than this film. Ah, same I here. Mean, no, same here. Keoghan is trying, and the idea that he's gone to this country house and they're all going to make him sort of the rube is is interesting for a while. But like you said, a out of nowhere turn in the last part of the film that it just ruins doesn't everything. make it any sense. It's so thing. dumb. And so it's fun. <laughs> it's like a it's like Downton Abbey if it suddenly turned into something on Spike TV. It's like uh, I can't recommend. Well, the this. mansion look, the estate looks like something yeah. out of Downton Abbey. Yeah, cool. I guess that's pretty much why it's, I mentioned that. It's a pretty well, it's pretty yeah. looking. <laughs> I pretty much thought it was a modern version of talented Mr. Ripley. Yeah, like you know, I said. Yeah. So it's, what you got is you know Barry you know Emerald. If you saw Promising Young Woman, you kind of get an idea as to what kind of director she's trying to be. She's trying to just go wild and big. And with this, look what you're getting when you see certain scenes that Barry does that has the audience gasping like, no, she didn't go there, but she did. Well, it's not promising for me. I loved that film. It was my number one movie that year, but this one is not. It makes no, the third act makes no sense. I mean, if you watch a movie, like let's say The Sixth Sense, okay, mm -hmm. and then you go back and you watch it again, you go, yeah, that all makes sense, but there were so many leaps that you have to take when, at the end of this movie, and you go like, that couldn't happen. The fact that, and I'm not going to give this away, the fact that... You can give it all away. No one should watch that this. That things don't catch <laughs> up to the Barry Keoghan character is ridiculous. This is so disappointing. Um, Promising Young Woman was my favorite movie of the year, the year that it was released. But, but this makes uh, me like it, that movie less. It's such a cynical endeavor. I don't know. It, 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 it was just... It was just... Every I was with it for the first hour, and then again, just completely ruined. And then ruined. Neil was done with ruined. it. Done. Right. You were salt burned. <laughs> All right. All right. Wilson, American fiction. What you have is a dramedy directed by Cord Jefferson, who previously worked for Gawker before becoming a screenwriter and winning an Emmy for Watchmen and writing on Succession. Here he makes his directorial debut directing Jeffrey Wright as a writer frustrated by how he's perceived by America as a black writer. Not only that, but he's going through some family drama, a building romance, so that in order to see how society treats him, 
he fictionalizes a story that he doesn't think is going to take off, but then takes off and he doesn't know how to stop it once fame starts coming along. And so what you have here is you have some drama, you have some comedy, lots of comedy with the, with the likes of it's Eric, a Apple, it's a Eric Alexander, Issa Rae, Leslie Uggams, Myra Lucretia Taylor, Sterling K. Brown, and John Ortiz. It's an ensemble that works, I think, for Court Jefferson. He never directed anything before, not a short, not a music video, and for his first time, he hit a home run. The, the film won the People's Choice Award in Toronto, which is, you know, like California voice when you're okay. trying to go for the Oscars. <laughs> I don't think he's still directed a movie. I mean, I like, don't love this thing, and I'll tell you why. It doesn't have the teeth. It has false teeth. It doesn't really come across like a Spike Lee film or uh, something that really has a message, because let me tell you something, talk about the last act, there's something that happens at the end of this movie, you're like, oh, they threw it all away. Uh, it's it's sitcom -y laughs, mm -mm. Sterling K. Brown mm -mm. is hilarious, but there's a lot going on, there's way too many subplots in this film, and I don't think it delivers on its promise. I really disagree with you. I think that what you, when you say it doesn't have enough teeth, I think what you're seeing is that this movie has more humanity. It's clever, but it's not merely cerebral, like a lot of literary satire and message movies can be. This one has this depth that kept me hooked. And I think that does have as much as the, w to do with the terrific script, uh, cast that you mentioned. I mean, especially to me, Erica Alexander is outstanding in this. And I mean, it's a new look for Sterling K. Brown here. He's like, he usually plays like the upstanding person in some way. And here he's like the slapdash brother coming out. He's so amazing. And I really dug this movie. The premise is stolen from the producers. I mean, Instead of let's find the no, worst it's, it's play the same ever one. written. I mean, you know, it's, not... it's 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 let's write the worst book ever written and like wow, look 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 what happens, what a surprise. But James Conn once said there are no original ideas, it's just how they're executed. Thank you, that's and my... it is executed well. James Conn I said thought, that? Yes, he did okay. at a junket. Okay. And Jeffrey Wright is very good and I love Sterling K. Brown in this. Listen, um you had the best line, we saw this at the Hampton Film Festival, and you said the movie thinks it's smarter than it actually is. And I like that line, and I think it's a good movie, I don't think it's a great movie. Movie, but good is good. Lisa, tell me about Anatomy of a Fool. Okay, honest to goodness, Neil. This courtroom drama uh, from director Justine Triette about the mysterious circumstances surrounding the death of a writer's husband may be the most French import of 2023. And by this I mean we really never know what's true and the only thing like this film is willing to moralize about is the fact that moralizing itself is a fool's errand. The question in hand is whether the writer who's played by Sandra Huller, who some people may recognize from the uh, German film Tony Erdman, which is super good, uh, whether she killed her husband or whether he committed suicide by falling off the deck. Or an accident. Right, that's what I just said. Or an act, I mean, an act, no, that, that seems like Michigas to me. Whether he committed suicide or killed his, her husband by falling off the deck of their rural chalet in France. Really though, I think this movie is about who's to blame when a marriage goes south, uh, what's reality when there's friction between a couple, and with the, young, the couple's young son and sadly their hapless dog at the center of the misery, I mean mystery. Uh, this film has been getting all kinds of raves. I find it in full disclosure to be a pretty cynical endeavor that it advertently highlights how the French legal system may be even more corrupt and biased than the American one, which is amazing. I thought it was an interesting, actually, I thought it was an amazing performance by Sandra. Oh, she's so good. You know, the movie's all about her, you know, and, and then you have a point about the legal system because you're wondering, how, does this, how would this play out in the States? So much, you know, so differently. So different, you know. <laughs> oh, we'll get a remake, don't and worry. And so, at first you're watching, <laughs> okay, how well, a third of it is in English. How do you solve a courtroom talk. drama? But then they take it outside of the courtroom, which is where it really excels. You know, without giving anything away, they would think when you focus on Sandra, and uh, the husband who passed away, you get some good performances there, and I think that's what they're highlighting more than the story itself. You can't give anything away because half the people who walk out of this movie think one thing and the other half think the other thing, and I think that's the greatness of the film. That is the it's brilliance easily, of the film. It's, I don't it's know, man. easily I in my top ten cynical. list. By the way, Hola is also in uh, Zone of Interest, and she's amazing in mm -hmm. that. This is a talent to watch. Maybe you've seen her before and knew she she's was coming super, on. She's super, super good. Yeah. I, I'm late to that party. I think this is absolutely one of the best films of the year, and if you hear people go, well, I, it doesn't really finish. No, it's all about the procedure, and it's all about 
as Lisa said, what's going on in not just French marriages, but all around the world. Yeah, I mean, I love the movie. It's it's a, it's not only a riveting courtroom drama, it's a mystery. And as you just said, you know, even though you don't find out what happens until the last couple of minutes of the movie. And actually, not everyone agrees about right. that. When you walk out of that theater, even after the credits roll, you're going... Well, did is is it really what they're telling me? And that to me is just brilliant. It's just Plus, so nobody's mentioned French. that the kid, the son, the twelve-year-old <laughs> yeah, boy, he's amazing. played by Michael Mikado uh, Branner. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's I mean, he good. should get an Oscar nomination. This kid is, and um, he's, he, this is a kid to watch. This is a talent to watch. Yeah. He's yeah. terrific, and it's such a smart movie, and it's such a great courtroom drama, and it examines a marriage, like you said. It's, right. it's like a little uh, the prosecuting attorney who looks like a skinhead. It examines. The, you know, like you have an argument with your wife, and all of a sudden the prosecuting attorney blows it out of proportion. Well, you know, it, I just think there's so many layers in this film. I loved it. Oh, Wonka no. is a new musical that looks at the origin story of Willy Wonka. Let's take a look at a clip. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. There appears to be a manufacturing error. Nobody eat the flowers. Uh, why not? What's wrong with them? What's the matter with this toadstool? My daughter took one bite and just look at her! There's nothing wrong with the chocolate milk, is there? I'm terribly sorry, everyone, and I know how to explain this, but... It appears that the chocolates have been poisoned! Poisoned? Poisoned? He poisoned my child! I didn't... I didn't poison them! I want my money back! I want compensation! I want revenge! Bill, tell us about Wonka. Well, I gotta tell you, I went into this thing going, why do we need a prequel to the Willy Wonka story? Because it sort of stands on its own. And I gotta tell you, Timothy Chalamet like dances pretty well, sings as much as he has to. A lot of the songs are singing, uh, talk singing. Uh, and I was charmed by this film. Uh, I didn't expect to like it. I thought it was uh, magical. And I, I give credit to uh, director Paul King, who's done all the Paddington movies, because he cleverly balances the comedy, the music, and keeps the story moving. Uh, there are three evil chocolatiers and a, a dirty cop with chocolate on his fingers played by uh, the always great uh, Keenan-Michael Key. Rowan Atkinson is uh, a vicar. Olivia Coleman is basically Leona Helmsley as an evil innkeeper. Uh, and we get Hugh Grant as a little Oompa Loompa. It all He's sounds embarrassing. Like it it all sounds like it should himself. work. Well I, well, I guess we're gonna disagree on this because this is the sort of thing that I would normally hate, but I was charmed by it. It's so funny you brought up Hugh Grant because I think his best performance on screen. Honest to God is Paddington 2, and I think this is one of the worst, most embarrassing performances of his life. Like, he's he's gone on record in press junkets and saying he hated doing this movie, he wished he hadn't done it. No, that's but I just think him being him. No, I don't agree. I think he genuinely is, he's, he's, appall like, he's appalled, and you can feel it from yeah, him. Yeah, I'm appalled But, more, watch, but more than that, here's the deal. I love baby doll Timothy Chalamet. I think the kid can do no wrong, but I never thought a movie about Willy Monka starring him could be boring, but that's what? how I felt about this movie. It's got pretty visuals. I always enjoy chocolate porn, but usually, you know, row doll stories balance sour and sweet. That's what's always interesting to me about them. And There's this no one, sour, no, really this here. is too saccharine. We, yeah. I never thought I'd see a Willy Wonka that is missing his droll complexity, but that's what's going on in this movie. When you get a Paul King film, having seen two or three of these Paddington films, you get Which an idea. Only two, but two yeah. you get an <laughs> idea as to what he's going to do. <laughs> but tell me, the Chalamet is the boy wonder right now, and he sells this movie. And when he sings, he can sing. Oh, you know, really? He can sing. I, I, no, I, I walked a very out of there thinking, I want to see him do Sweeney Todd. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But he can sing. And what the rest would you of the cast, be in that? You know, he so as far as Hugh Grant, he's just taking a check. <laughs> if he's going to talk about, like, I didn't like doing this, then why are you do it? Because yeah, I he thought he was Paul a good favorite. sport. I thought he was a really good sport. You know, it's like he's just in it for the game. It's bloated, it's forced, it's overproduced, and it tries too hard to please. And I know Lisa probably agrees with me on that. Yeah, right? of course. And, you know, yes, the sets and the costumes are dazzling, but it doesn't matter. I don't think Timothy Chalamet has the charisma for this. He's no Gene Wilder. No, you're I think wrong. his voice is passable at no, best. No, I think he's good. I think it's a terrible script. Mm -hmm. Honestly, well, I think that's the problem with this movie. Bad script. Well, uh, the script is the pro is the problem with this movie. And I think if you're 
12, 12, well, first of all, there are no memorable songs. No, kids Can are going to remember be... one song? Well, no. it finishes with the song from... Uh, yeah, but that's not the... That's yeah, the real I was debating no, taking... Yeah, can you remember any songs, any songs from the previous one? Of course. Yeah, I can. I can. <laughs> Oompa, loompa, <laughs> Listen, okay, adults will go. be bored, <laughs> but if you have a kid that's 12... Now, nah, I'm going too high. 10. 10 years old and under... I think they'll be charmed. No, by I think the jokes are clever for all ages. I really, d I was taken with. All right, Wilson, tell me about Rustin. Rustin is pretty simple. Basically, it's directed by George C. Wolfe, who previously directed Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Here, what you have mm. is the story of how the 1963 famed March on Washington was established, and it's done by gay civil rights leader, actually activist Bayard Rustin, played by Coleman Domingo. Amazing, and he's great. He's, he's great. amazing in this movie, and you know. What's funny enough is that you have dissension within his own party who don't want him involved. So what, you're thinking this is going to be a film about whites and blacks, but no. It's about his own people who don't want him involved mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. but, and how much he had to face adversity to get this thing done and pretty much his relationship with Martin Luther King played by Mel Ming. This is the best that we've seen Coleman Domingo done. He's played for the most part a lot of supporting roles and for here, he takes it on all the way. The movie's all about him. Mm -hmm. You know, you have supporting characters like Chris Rock and Jeffrey Wright to come in, and they spark it up a little bit, but it's pretty much Coleman Domingo. And it's his show, him. man. You know, it's his show. You know, and, you know, to know these stories, and I never heard of the guy to this movie. Right. So, Which is, it, a lot of people haven't, and it's a crying shame. I just want to get out of the way. I do think it suffers from some of the flaws that can afflict biopics. It can bog down in details. It has almost a stifling need to honor its subject, who does deserve to be honored. He's amazing. But sometimes the more I think that a director or writer is invested in the topic, the more that they can suffer from, from the heaviness of that. But what, the good news here is that it's directed by George C. Wolfe, right, who is best known for such sly stage productions as bringing the noise, bringing the funk. And he kind of brings in this innovative director directorial style that I think transcends the script when it, when it gets bogged down. And also, man, am I with you, that Coleman Domingo is out of sight in this Critics movie. Critics Choice nominated him as... He is lit up from inside yeah, yeah. with this like heartbreaking complexity that just allows you to understand how Rustin could single-handedly like break so many barriers and pretty much always be out without selling himself out when a moment when it was literally a crime to be gay and to be black. Like, what an amazing well, story why, and what an amazing why, performance. That's why he's the forgotten figure in history yeah, because he is, of his um, sexuality. No, I mean, you don't have to tell us, Neil. I, I we know, all, but that's, but we all know. But the, the success of what she's saying, what we're all saying really is the success is we didn't know this story and we found a big thing that we knew all about and yet we didn't know the, the little catalyst that got the whole thing I mean, put on really in the first place. I mean, he really is the one who talked As I started everybody to say, we into got, doing everything. He's going to get mm -hmm. nominated for, uh, he's already been nominated for Critics' Choice. I hope he gets an Oscar nomination. Oh, I do uh, too. Oof. This is a great, great performance, and everyone should see it. I will mention, you have to go hunting for it on Netflix. It is not easy to find. Mm -hmm. So please, please, please dig through the recent Just releases. Just like search. R U S T I N. Okay, right. Six letters. I, 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 what he said. What he said. You're my new IT guy. I, I, listen, I, I think it's an important story, yeah. and I'm glad that we're all aware of it now. I agree with you. They do fall into some biopic tropes along the way. But, they, but I defy but you but not they, to have a, a tear in your eye at the end. No, no, no. no. But it's, I honestly it's think very it's good. 100 percent worth watching. It's no, amazing. It, 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 it's very good. And Coleman Domingo, mm -hmm. man, like wow, talk about performances. Oh, good, good point. We hadn't brought that no, up. No, I'm just reiterating. So you're saying he was good? <laughs> We freely used the atomic bomb. In fact, Doctor, you assisted in selecting the target to drop the atomic bomb on Japan, didn't you? Yes. Well, then you knew, did you not, that by dropping that atomic bomb on the target you selected, that thousands of civilians would be killed or injured. Is that correct? Yes, not as many as turned out. Oh, well, how many were killed or injured? 70,000. 70,000, both Hiroshima and... 110,000 in both. On the day of each bombing? Yes. That was a clip from the movie Oppenheimer. It's one of Wilson Morales' favorite movies of the year as we go around the panel with our personal favorite films from 2023. Wilson. My favorite movie of the year was American Fiction, which we already discussed. But, so I would say my second favorite movie of the year was Oppenheimer, which you just saw a clip. Directed by Christopher Nolan. It's his finest film ever. Mm. He's done other movies, but with this really? one, he wanted to talk about how the atomic bomb was really put together and the amount of teams that it took you know, to have 
Killian Murphy, lead this cast of stars Robert Downey Jr., Emily Blunt, and a host of Oscar-nominated actors and winners. I think there's a lot that goes in there. All cylinders are working from the score, the production design, as well as the visual effects. And there's certain scenes that stand out, and that's why I called it my best of the year. Second best. I'm not with you, but I want Lisa to tell Lisa I think this is go. easily the most overrated film of the year. I am honestly starting to think Holy Christopher crap. Nolan goes, yes, I, I honestly think that Christopher Nolan goes out of his way to find subjects that allow him to feature only white men, straight white men, at the center with women as mere shrews and sex objects. This is a bloated, talking movie that somehow sidesteps the moral implications of the horror at its core, including, by the way, the impact of the A-bomb tests on the local native community, which were pretty much ruined for generations from those tests. I think the only thing good about this film, besides Robert Downey Jr., who I think uh, has, a, if you don't know the history, has a nice twist, is the fact that America went back to the movie theaters and saw this in Barbie. I, uh, that's remarkable to me. At least give it that it, yes, it's oh, no, 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 talking. And it's three it's hours. No, I, three mean, hours. I, I agree with I, you I was, that the Barbie Heimer phenomenon was hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the but movie I mean, doesn't stand people, for me. I didn't think it was going to make 10 cents. Uh, I don't love it as much as you do. It's not in my top 10 list. But in my top uh, I respect that he tried to make a, a decent movie, and I like all of Look, Christopher Look, uh, I respect the fact that it's an intelligent movie made for grown-ups. But that, but you understood but, it too. Yeah, but despite that, you know, yes, it is overly long at three hours. It's very <laughs> talky. You, everybody's raving about Robert Downey Jr.'s performance, and I'm wondering if it's that good of a performance, or it's, if it's just that different from the snarky uh, yeah. Iron Man yeah, and yeah, other performances yeah. that we see from Robert well, Downey yeah. Jr. Yeah. And this McCarthyism red thing that after, you know, later in life after they drop the bomb, you know. Um, that keeps getting Are we actually supposed to feel bad for Baby Oppen Oppenheimer? Right. Like, it was so saying, annoying. It, getting, it doesn't take talky. Einstein to... Oh, wait, it does. <laughs> I, I gotta tell you the truth. I, I, I mean, it, it's okay, but I was often bored at times. Okay, I, I okay, we was. good. See, okay. three times. Bill, I'm dying of suspense. Tell me your favorite movie of the year. Well, from Oppenheimer, <laughs> one of the most seen movies, to one of the least seen movies mm. of the year, it's called Sisu, S-I-S-U. It's a Finnish term. It doesn't have a, a, an American translation. Mm. And it's basically, until we get a Roadrunner Wiley Coyote movie, which we may or may not get next year. A live action This is Roadrunner. live action <laughs> Roadrunner. This is more of Wiley Coyote. Uh, and it's lean and gory World War II tale of a prospector who uh, is on his way with a sack of gold to the bank when uh, in northern Finland when a bunch of Nazis try and capture this ex-commando. They get his gold, and that's the last thing in the world they should have done. It's, uh, well, he has a special set of skills. Not, he does have a special <laughs> set of skills. Um, it, it's, it's wild. It's over the top. I didn't have a better time at the, at the movies all year long. It's filled with unknown actors. Uh, led by Jorma Tamila, see? And uh, it was directed by a guy named uh, Jalmari Halander, who did big games with, uh, in 2014, with that, that dopey uh, Samuel Jackson thing where he was the president and he's in the woods and this little kid helps him escape. Uh, don't go by that. Sisu, S-I-S-U, you can stream it right now, and you should. I can't Please. say much. Did you watch it on a plane? Because I <laughs> <laughs> never heard of it. But, you know, hey, you liked it, you liked it. I did. <laughs> yeah, it's like Liam Neeson meets, uh, like, John Wick. I mean, this guy could beat the hell out of Liam Neeson. Lisa, your favorite movie of 2023. Hands down, it's Poor Things. Yeah, well, I'm not surprised you don't like it, and I'm also, I, 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 was, I shouldn't have been surprised that the most original coming-of-age story in decades is an adaptation by Yorgos uh, Lanthimos, who's responsible for such totally out-there sci-fis as The Lobster. I was, though. Uh, this one stars Emma Stone in this brilliant, visually stunning subversion of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein story. I can't explain the whole premise without spoilers, but suffice it to say, it is a hilariously radical take on men's need to control female bodies and sexuality. Uh, Emma plays a rule-breaking child in a woman's body, and the film kind of takes its cues from her wild sensibilities and sensuality, shall we say, against a backdrop of an alternative century, like alternative universe, 19th century Europe. This is such a carnal, such a visceral movie that it's definitely an acquired taste that's not for everyone, but it boasts these really droll, deeply felt, supportive performances from the likes of Mark Ruffalo, who's super funny here. He's Christopher, like Terry Thomas. Christopher Abbott, <laughs> Willem Dafoe, <laughs> and I've always respected and liked Emma Stone, but I think this is a career high performance from her. I just think it's embarrassing 
thing. And I respect that you like this movie because a lot of people like this I movie. Love but it. I love it. And maybe I'm an, a prude, but man, you are I, a prude. Felt really, I felt really bad for Emma Stone in this movie. Are you kidding? You did she not got, have she to. Got slickered she into was, making this no, no, thing. no, no. She worked she on this program for six, six years. years. Emma's very bold in this movie. She's yeah. bold. She, I, she's daring. You know, what the script called for her to do as an actress, that's a lot to take on. And she did it. She carried it well. She helped cultivate this and movie. Not only, it's not just only her performance, but you know the production design, the costume the production design. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, amazing. It's like the smarter she gets, the smarter the movie gets. And the first hour of the film, I'm like, what in the world is going on here? And as it goes on, I'm, by the end of the movie, I'm like, this is terrific. It's a dry comedy. It's nuts. <laughs> It's but not ultimately, make I'll sense. tell you, it's nothing like you've ever seen before on screen. Oh, and, and that's definitely the it. like making money is no, the barometer no, I, of whether I, I it's good. Twenty years ago, this would have been Tilda Swinton. All right, that's but, right. When it comes to my favorite movie of 2023, there were some strong runners up on my list, like Past Lives and Anatomy of a Fall. But my favorite movie of the year was The Holdovers, which reunited Alexander Payne with actor Paul Giamatti. They did Sideways together. Now, it takes place in 1970 at a stuffy elite boarding school. Giamatti plays an ancient history teacher who's despised by all of his students, and he hates all of them. So when Christmas break comes up, he's left with the unwanted task of babysitting five teens who, for various reasons, can't be picked up by their parents and are stuck at the school for the holidays. The movie is filled with dry wit and dark comedy. Giamatti is great here, so is newcomer Dominic Sessa as a lone troubled student. Plus, yes. Devine Joy Randolph, as the school's grieving cook, who's also stuck there for Christmas, is marvelous. Together, these three form a newly found dysfunctional family, all of whom have major problems of their own. Director Payne surprises you with so many different turns, and in the process, he makes some incisive statements about human nature and loneliness. Ultimately, The Holdovers is touching, and it's such a smart and engaging film on so many levels, that's why it's my favorite movie of 2023. Well, that's about all the time, unfortunately, that we have. I want to thank Bill McCuddy, the return of my friend Lisa Rossman, Wilson Morales, and I'm Neil Rosen. Please join us next time on Talking Pictures.